within humanities, we have to think about how technology is creating impact on human beings. And in particular, the area in which I work is how imperialism is created. So I got a chance to look at an enterprise which is not otherwise looked at as an imperialist enterprise, but I got a chance to highlight how English literature, which was a colonial discipline, how it was used as a tool to alter subjectivities in our part of the world. So it is that background of mine in humanities and also in trying to understand various dimensions of imperialism that enabled me to work on this area. So today I would be talking about this topic and this is a brief preview of my presentation. So I would start with uh, what I've titled Context Matters and what to do about the tilt. So I'll explain it to you very shortly because I think that it is very crucial to realize that it is not a level plane on which all this unravels, this debate about AI, this debate about machine learning and various power dynamics that are involved. So it's, there, is, there is a tilt that has to be understood. I call it the tilt. And then I will be talking about dynamics of power and AI threat assess assessment. Now in humanities, we many scholars have theorized power. So I'll briefly connect those debates and that discourse with the AI threats that are emerging. And after that, I will be moving on to AI and imperialism and quickly on to uh, the final part, which would be countering AI hegemony. And finally, uh, and of course, one method of that, which I would like to focus today would be decolonizing AI. Now, first of all, as I've already highlighted, it is this context really matters. Now in this, at the very beginning, I would like to mention two scholars. One is Zuboff who says that this term artificial intelligence and what does it entail, it keeps on changing. So as she writes here that say artificial intelligence since at least 2003, but the term itself is a moving target. As capabilities have evolved from primitive programs that can play tick tock toe to systems that can operate whole fleets of driverless cars. Now, another thing that I would like to highlight here is and I want all of us to think about it. What is behind, uh, what is uh, the force behind this sort of oscillation of uh, what AI is about? And this discourse, which is gradually unraveling. And uh, of course, it is a contesting ground, what we call in humanities that this discourse terrain, that this is contesting ground itself. So I think that uh, all those who are thinking about AI and are thinking about human beneficial systems, they have to, I think, shift focus and also try to understand what this is about. And I would like to complement it with uh, Dr. Suman Gupta, although he's a humanities scholar, he was also one of my PhD supervisors. And we had a conversation with him, which is available on YouTube at this link in which uh, he has basically written a book, which is uh, conversations between an AI engineer and a humanities researcher. It has recently come out and it is based on his conversations with Peter Tu. Both of them were together at Oxford University. Now I would like to mention just one part in that conversation that we had with him in which he highlighted or he discussed how what we consider intelligence is only a reductive understanding of what intelligence is about. I think it connects very neatly with the debates we had earlier or the debate which is going on, particularly looking at AI ethics from the Islamic perspective. And it is the question of why, the question of why do something. So for instance, we can always program 
uh, a computer to do certain tasks and of course learn from its acquired data. But at the same time, there is a very important aspect of intelligence, which is why do something. So I think that still rests with the human agency and I will connect it uh, to my later points as well. So I think that it is important to consider this evolution. I haven't come across a paper, probably many must have written on it, that how this idea has evolved or how this nomenclature has evolved, what we would perhaps like to call the politics of naming AI. So if we look at this again, the context which matters, we need to look at the historical context and how things happen. Because of course, if we think about technology and how technology was put to use, then we have a history. I have a quote from a UN special report on contemporary forms of racism. And according to him, it is uh, the emerging that emerging digital technologies exacerbate and compound existing inequalities, many of which exist along racial, ethnic and national origin grounds. So this is again important that how these extrapolate and enter into AI, the field of AI, and how AI acquires uh, 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 those biases. I think Dr. Junaid Kadir also talked about it. Then there is this international historical context as well, that although colonization has come to an end, the apparent structures, but the logic of coloniality, it still remains. And that logic of coloniality is impacting AI ethics. And this is something which is discussed in the final part of my talk, which is that how AI has to be decolonized. Now, again, another aspect that is extremely important and it comes to us as a history in which this scholar, Simon Gekandi, mentions or chronicles the slave masters' fastidious record keeping of the actions of their slaves, such that this archive constituted the evidence of the latter's objectification and indeed as the symbol of the barbarianism that enabled white civilization and its modernist cravings. Now, again, I would like to zero in on this important matter that AI can be there, it might do wonderful things, machine learning might be there, but then I think that perhaps that is also employed as a sort of a decoy. And instead, we need to shift focus on the human agency as well, which is behind the creation of those AI systems. Now, moving on, this one, which comes to us from this remarkable paper or seminal paper by Shakir and others, that they expand on the colonial continuities of extraction and exploitation of land, labor, and relations through digital infrastructure. Now, this continuity is very important and it has to be understood. Now, if we move on, and I read a very interesting paper on robot wars, which gave this valuable information, which can be equated or sorry, juxtaposed with our discussion today regarding AI ethics, that for instance, how this Asimov's law is now uh, abandoned. And robots, the first law, which states that a robot must not harm human being, that has been uh, sort of forgotten. And in this paper, look at this uh, very dangerous statement which is mentioned here, and it's from a journal on security studies. It says, by outsourcing the act of killing to artificial agents, violence, at least from the perspective of the US military, would transmute into an engineering exercise like building a bridge planned and executed by robots. Now, another US Department of Defense funded study predicts that in the longer term, fully robotic soldiers may be developed and deployed, particularly by wealthier countries. Now, I would connect this to this statement, which talks about the state power, and probably this has to be complicated or problematized as well, but not now, perhaps towards the end, I'll talk about it 
that the artificial cyborgian and algorithmic materializations of state power in the world system. And then I've added and the instrumentarian power of surveillance capitalism. And I offer a definition of what Zuboff means by this instrumentarian power. So we cannot simply focus on the state power utilizing big data. We, I think, need to focus more on these corporations who have adopted various strategies to fortify the term which is used by Zuboff and also to dispossess opposition. So we need to take that into account. And Zuboff defines instrumentarian power in her book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, that its expression in a ubiquitous, sensate, networked, computational infrastructure that I call Big Other, and the novel and deeply anti-democratic vision of society and social relations that these produce. Now, she is talking about these big corporate giants, or whatever they are called in the jargon, uh, especially institutions like, of course, Google and Facebook, and how they have adopted various earlier strategies, which earlier capitalists adopted, and they have sort of strengthened their hold and their hegemony. Now, this is also central to any debates about, or any debate about AI ethics. So this is, okay. Now, this also is important, and this is basically what is uh, a problematic and which needs to be addressed, that how digital technologies function at a neurological level to capture and coax human impulses. That is important. And I think that this is what Dr. Junaid was talking about in his introductory session, where he was talking about nudging and sort of coming up with some ethical framework to ensure that this nudging happens for the good and not for the bad. But again, the point is that uh, 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 it is re-engineering us as computable, as human beings as computable. Now, the reason why I've mentioned this is, of course, all of you know about it, that this is going on in AI uh, currently, and this is what we consider dangerous. But the point simply is that human agency which works in a clandestine way. And I would like to highlight that that human agency has not changed. So a lot of parallels can be offered. I have mentioned just one or two maybe, I'll mention a couple more, that how during colonialism, for instance, how technology, whatever technology existed back then, how it was employed to ensure certain results. And in the current debates on AI, what is happening is I feel that the elephant in the room is being ignored. And instead, we are working for them. Because of course, the world over, I think it would be an interesting assessment to see the projects that are underway all over the world right now to come up with ethical frameworks of AI, how are those projects funded? or who is funding those projects. Now, we need to see where is the money coming from. And if the money is coming from the people or from the organizations who are called digital tyrants by Shoshana Zuboff, then the point is that what aches is there for them to grind in all this? Why do they want to acquire this data from all over the world that the best minds from everywhere, from the global north and the global south, what is it that they are thinking right now? And of course, I'm using Foucauldian logic here, who is another uh, humanist uh, scholar, who says, for instance, that the purpose of establishing a discipline in a university is not just to disseminate knowledge about that discipline, but to also ensure how it has to be circumscribed how it has to be regulated, how it has to be uh, reduced to certain rather innocuous uh, uh, items and that how can it be defanged? So I think that the debate about, uh, debate about AI ethics should also take that into account that it must not ignore what is left out of this debate. 
So it would be a very good understanding of what. So another example is offered regarding psychometry and the whole discipline of psychology is built on these assumptions that how these were used for certain racist objectives. And recently, a film that has come out in April 2021, Raoul Peck's Exterminate All the Brutes, which is based on three books, and one most important from where it has got its title is Sven Linquist's book with the same title, Exterminate All the Brutes. So he has given that evidence and he has elaborated how that technology evolved, for instance, uh, the machine gun, that how killing at a distance became that advantage for the colonizers and how in a Africa and America and in South Asia, millions were brutally killed because of that advancement in technology. Now, can we sort of imagine ourselves in that scenario, whereas philosophers and scholars we are sort of uh, being funded by the same colonizers and we are asked to sort of come up with regulatory or ethical mechanism of those machine guns. It's that human agency which is behind it, which matters. And I think that this node has to be connected with, with, with the Islamic paradigms, that it is this human agency that has to be civilized. The idea of Tazkiyah Nafs, for instance, or the idea of refinement of that human soul or human self, that matters. Otherwise, of course, we'll be working at their behest. Similarly, for instance, research. Now, we don't think about research as something good, but a native uh, scholar from a Maori community in New Zealand, she has written an excellent book, Decolonizing Research Methodologies, and she mentions in it and she starts her book by saying that research is a dirty word for her community. Why? Because it was that research which enabled the colonizers to dispossess that community from their lands and to marginalize them. And their ancestors who were sacred to them, their bones were sacred to them. These colonizers came or this colonizing researcher came and they evaluated their cognitive uh, potential by putting mallet seeds in the skulls of their ancestors and then coming up with the result that they had lesser cognitive capacity. And of course, it has to suit the philosophy which they had back then, the racist philosophy, which said that human beings are not equal and there, there is this hierarchy and the white races are superior and the rest are inferior. Now, Moving on to the next part, which is pertaining to AI and imperialism, I think that this is interesting, the modern form of imperialism. Now, in humanities and in post-colonial, especially in decolonial studies, we give a lot of importance to these power dynamics between nations. So, for instance, any regulatory mechanism in December, our uh, minister for IT stated that shortly we'll have an AI policy, and it was reported widely in the press. And I read the detail of that news story and it simply had that news. He said that shortly we'll have an AI policy. Now scholars have written about it and they say that wherever these are implemented, these national AI policies and strategies are almost exclusively found in the global north. And then of course, those are copied by countries in the global south. Now this has to be looked into. Why is it that this is happening? There are, of course, various reasons. Primarily, I think it is because of the continuation of that colonial model of the state, because of which there is no real uh, democratic uh, consultation. And the scholars who are working in the area rigorously and honestly, their potential is not utilized by the state. Rather, of course, uh, again, uh, certain uh, vested interest groups occupy those places, and then they come up with this uh, copy-paste mechanism. And even those countries where this is happening, again, look at the agency, look at the power which is propelling this sort of a dialogue or this sort of a debate, that it's being driven by supra-state bodies such as the World Economic Forum. Now, I would say that this ghaib, which is usually considered ghaib, and allow me to say it that, for instance, right now we are 
here we are discussing and we are debating, I hope that Dr. Junaid would allow me to say it, that that Rebi Kuwait, which has ensured this interaction, is of course one of that Kuwait is Facebook, which has sought off, which has, uh, I think, funded a project to develop a framework, AI ethical framework. Now this, what sort of changes will come into the way we think if we bring that to the center of our debate? And I have a lot of arguments in favor of it that this has actually happened. For instance, in our colonial past, there were people who said that the first objective that we have is that we need to win independence from the colonizers. Yet there were others who said that, well, that's a reality, you need to accept it. And under that sort of an umbrella, we, it's all right to take funding from them and let's work on ilmi uh, things like for instance, Nadwa uh, Tulolama, uh, and there were many other uh, even religious uh, scholars, great religious scholars who were apolitical and who thought that, well, they are there, they are rulers, accept them, and then work uh, in the areas of epistemology and knowledge and religious knowledge and whatnot. Now, anybody who was willing to do that received lots of money from the same British colonizers. But see where we have arrived. Now the whole world, all the scholars have a consensus that colonization of this part of uh, uh, land, this part of the world, it was uh, at the detriment of all the races and religions which existed here back then. And of course, the statistical data is also well documented and presented. So I think that again, so <clears throat> the issue of sham autonomy and mainstream knowledge formations, those are repeated. So it's just a sort of a delusion that we operate in a sort of an autonomy. Well, I think that uh, if we go deep into the way we have also been trained through colonial institutions and the discourse which is readily available and the resources that are provided, I think that we somehow, we live in this sort of a delusional state where we think that we are saying something which is ours, while actually it is not. So I think that, uh, again, it's about the same thing. I would like to connect this to what decolonial scholars have highlighted, and they say that we live in a colonial matrix of power. And they highlight that there are these sides to it, that on the one hand, knowledge and subjectivities are controlled, on the other, economy, are, uh, economy is controlled, Authority is there. If you look at these global institutions which exist, even gender and subjectivity, racism and patriarchy. So this is a model that they say that we live within that colonial matrix of power. So another interesting question would be for AI theorists and especially ethicists to see where do we feature in it or where do they feature in this colonial matrix of power? Now, I've already mentioned it and see how Shoshana Zuboff mentions it and says that surveillance capitalism is not technology. Again, the canvas that she has in front of her, as I've read the book in detail, and I gave a talk at Punjab University on this particular book, on this very important book, which is also being called the most important book of 21st century. Now, her canvas is also Western capitalist. But within that, this is what she says, that she also highlights that it is the human agency that matters. It's the owners of these companies who make certain decisions because of which this technology unravels in a certain way. And it is that which matters. And it is that which has to be regulated. Now, surveillance capitalism is not technology. It is a logic that imbues technology and commands it into action. Of course, I'm not offering you a definition of surveillance capitalism. I'm sure that most of you already know about it, that it utilizes human uh, behavior as surplus commodity. And then it acquires it, and then it sends it, uh, sells it to other companies, and based on which it, it, it gathers a lot of profit. Now quickly I'm moving towards the last section. How much time do I have? 
not based on your schedule, based on the actual beginning. But okay, I'll wind it up earlier. Now she says that AIs are current Trojan horses. Surveillance capitalism is not artificial intelligence. It employs it. So AI then becomes a tool. I think that a lot of, uh, uh, I, perhaps I should just call it propaganda, lots of narratives which are more buoyant, which are more visible, somehow try to accord this agency to AI. Now that's deception, plain deception, because it may, these systems may employ uh, those generative mechanisms and machine learning, what is called, but still it is the command center is elsewhere. So those are human beings who make those decisions. And the point is that we cannot, if we look at the history of those who have colonized and those who have exploited human beings in the past, this is not the first time that this is happening. No amount of polite persuasion has ever convinced them not to do it. This connects it with our debate pertaining to Islam in which these two paradigms are presented. One is that you have to sort of, you have to convince people to do good things. You have to tell them to do good things. All right, fine. But what about the structure which is present, which ensures that market principles are implemented, that anybody who does not follow those principles is simply presented as a sort of uh, uh, arrives at an Ibratna Kanjam. So I th and then there are others who say that, well, that paradigm has to be transformed and it has to be established on the basis of justice and peace and prosperity for all and egalitarianism as well. So I think that I would skip this part. And again and again, we get lots of evidence of this, that it is the human agency which drives this sort of uh, development. And it's not AI. So I would also like to call it, I've just thought of it right now, that there is a sort of a personification of AI ethics, or sorry, artificial intelligence, which is going on, a term that we use in literature, where something which is not a person is presented by poets as a person. So I would say that this personification of AI is going on, and this is something similar. And I think Zuboff also mentioned it, that when we called or when our legal systems called a company, a person, and by doing that shifted the responsibility from human beings onto this rather intersubjective reality, if I use Harari's terminology. Now, something similar is happening right now. The responsibility is being shifted from human beings onto this concoction or this personification of AI. Now, this would be very important to take this into account. And I think that that is my primary takeaway uh, that I would like you to ponder over later on. Now, again, from Zuboff, that this technology's DNA comes already patterned by what sociologist Marx Weber called the economic orientation. Now, who gave it that economic orientation? Of course, those human beings. So we have a few options available and pertaining to this conference, I mentioned the first part that uh, what sort of options are available. One is that we Islamize AI. Now, of course, the word in our Pakistani context is uh, not a very positive word as we saw what happened earlier on. And as a, a, an example is given in my university where I work, that a vice chancellor was quizzed or questioned during General Zaul Haq's tenure that we have received these instructions to Islamize knowledge. We can Islamize probably social science or humanities. What about sciences? How do we Islamize science? And somebody retorted and said, well, if you say that uh, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen combine, you will get water. But if you say that two atoms of oxygen and one atom of oxygen merge or combine, then it will inshallah become water that is Islamizing science. So the point is that these things can really be very superficial. It can simply be 
a sort of uh, giving it a new dress. Now that has to be, uh, I think that uh, uh, we need to rethink about that. And the other ideas are to come up with a more benevolent AI and the details are available. I think the most potent suggestions that are offered are these that there is this critical philosophy which is available, which is given by humanists or humanist scholars, especially people from Latin America. It is called, the movement is called decoloniality and they've got their elaborate uh, uh, terminologies and digging tools and investigative tools. So the idea is presented that this AI has to be decolonized. So we have these suggestions and this paper is the most seminal paper which discusses these issues. And they have offered various suggestions, for instance, that AI metropoles and peripheries as a means of developing inter intercultural ethics. But then the point is that all interactions between the metropoles and the peripheries exist in a tilted space. So already you've got greater power in the global north and it is invisible, it is there. That level, that civil space, for instance, that equal civil space, that doesn't exist. They have that sort of uh, 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 context in which everything goes to their side. So I think that in that context, we need to think about decoloniality. And one principle of decoloniality is epistemic delinking, that deliberately you stop engaging with Western ideas and Western theories. And one of the methods, according to Walter Magnolo, one of the decolonial methods is also the Islamic method. So that can be brought in. But again, another decolonial principle also obstructs in the way of thinking about such matters in a pan-Islamic manner. Because our history and engagement with Islam, the fasir that have evolved, if we look at hadith literature, hadith theorizations, I think that the evidence is very strong that Islam has unraveled in different geographies and in different uh, parts of the world in certain different ways. Of course, there were certain paradigms that were immutable, but based on those parameters, then Islam was also indigenized. For instance, we do have a South Asian, allow me to say it, that certain things were tweaked according to local context. And the most extreme example or most prominent, sorry, example would be that of the Chishtia Silsila and how they sort of indigenized Islam. So decolonial method is one method. I would like to quickly move uh, to the, and there are other options as well. For instance, this Naguni philosophy of Ubuntuism that uh, instead of focusing on rationality, it focuses on relationality. So it says, I am because we are. So I would also like to connect it to the Islamic philosophy and lots of, uh, I think, evidence that we get from Shah Waliullah in which he also highlights this and in the Savuf literature where it is highlighted. And now even we have biological evidence for that. I'll just wind up in two minutes. Okay. So finally, uh, let me move to the last slide. And then there are, again, even with decoloniality, there are decolonial dangers, which are highlighted by, for instance, this writer, Leon Musavi, and the, it's called Decolonial Bandwagon and the Dangers of Intellectual Decolonization. He's a sociologist. So he has highlighted these dangers that should be avoided. The, the, uh, this is also there, and I found it really very interesting. It is Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence Working Group, and they, the, these are their basic concerns. So from an Indigenous perspective, what should our relationship with AI be? And similarly, how can Indigenous epistemologies and ontologies contribute to the global conversation regarding society and AI? Again, I would say that we living in this part of the world, for instance, we can bring in Shavaliullah since he's indigenous to this area and he has presented lots of ideas that could be equated. I'm sure we have another session on it where we'll talk about it in detail. Now, this is my final slide. And I would, uh, instead of simply reading it out, of course, Zuboff says that there has to be this crucial friction and all that, but her 
idea is also very individualistic. And I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier on, that she mentions it, uh, she debates all this issue in the context of capitalism and in the context of, of course, uh, lots of things going on there. But still, I don't think that we can accept it as it is. Rather, we have to indigenize that resistance model also. And finally, I would like to point out that to counter AI hegemony or to counter uh, surveillance capitalism and imperialism, I think that instead of looking at it from a pan-Islamic perspective, we need to look at it from national perspectives. And for instance, those of us who are here in Pakistan, I think that we need to look at it, how, what sort of regulatory mechanisms will emerge, which will harness these, uh, this potential of AI and ensure that it will move towards human beneficial ends. But for that, of course, it's not going to happen even if these are made and presented to the government. Because again, this is a question of human agency. So I think that we need to have a greater sort of solidarity and some tangible steps have to be made because in the real world, it's that uh, it power dynamics come into play. So if we stop a person, my final two sentences, and ask him to do something, why should he do it? So the point is that we also need to bring in what sort of power, what sort of uh, force are we going to develop as, let's say, representatives of ordinary human beings who are thinking more about human beneficial systems as compared to those who are entrenched and in power and ensconced. So I think that we need to develop this sort of strategic identity, us versus them, where them become those who are at the helm of affairs and us become ordinary human beings. And then we come up with some sort of a plan to counter these newer forms of imperialism. Thank you very much.